Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're checking out our first GeForce RTX 5090 partner card, the MSI Supreme SoC. And when compared to the NVIDIA's Founders Edition model, this thing is massive. Absolutely massive. In fact, it's ridiculously massive, even compared to the 4090 Supreme, which, you know, back when I got this graphics card, I thought this was massive. It's certainly, certainly still a big graphics card, but somehow this one is even bigger and even heavier. Absolutely ridiculous, yeah. Um, it is, it is a, it's a big graphics card. I don't really know how else to describe how absurdly massive this thing is, but hopefully by flipping it around, giving you guys a few different angles of it, you're starting to get a sense for how ridiculously massive this graphics card is. But before we get into the dimensions and all that good stuff, Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by ASUS and their entire range of AMD X870 motherboards featuring robust VRM configurations designed to tackle AMD's latest Ryzen 9000 series of processors with ease, whether it be the affordable Prime X870-P Wi-Fi or class-leading ROG Crosshair X870E Hero. The Hero also takes advantage of ASUS's cutting-edge Nitro Path DRAM technology, which provides the best DDR5 memory performance of any X870 motherboard we've tested, and we've tested just about all of them. There's also a number of features on offer that make the DIY processor breeze, such as M.2 Q release, M.2 Q slide, M.2 Q latch, PCIe slot Q release slim, Q antenna, and Q LED. There's loads more features, so many in fact that I couldn't cover them even if this was a 10 minute ad read. So for more information, please check the links in the video description. Right, so we might as well get the elephant in the room out of the way, the dimensions. This large graphics card measures 359 millimeters long, which makes it 5% longer than the already massive 1490 Supreme. It also stands from the PCIe connector 150 millimeters tall, which is pretty common for a high-end product, but still very big overall. But it's really the width that's supersized here. Normally a thick graphics card would be considered around 55 to 65 millimeters wide, but what we have here is a 76 millimeter wide monster that'll take up at least four expansion slots. So given those dimensions, it probably won't shock you to learn that it weighs 2,836 grams, and that is an insane amount of weight to place on your PCIe slot. Now addressing this concern, MSI has included a very basic GPU stand. It should work well enough, but it is surprisingly basic given how extremely high end and expensive this product is, and I was a bit disappointed to learn that it's primarily constructed from plastic rather than aluminium, so it does feel very cheap. I guess MSI assumes here that you'll have a high quality case that takes care of this issue for you, but yeah, I would have liked to have seen a much higher quality stand included with such a premium product. Now, while the GPU stand might look and feel a bit cheap, thankfully the Supreme SoC certainly doesn't. The front side of the card is wrapped in a gray plastic shroud, which has been partially wrapped in brushed aluminium to give it a bit more of a, a classy premium look, and it also does look very aggressive overall. Embedded in the shroud are three large 105 millimeter fans, and these don't feature any RGB effects, though there are some LED light bars surrounding them, which you know looks fine. The fans are brushless models made by PowerLogic, though I couldn't find any information on the specific models used here. Generally speaking, these fans aren't that costly to replace should they fail outside of the warranty, though be aware replacing them yourself will require quite a bit of experience as you will need to pull the entire card down to disconnect the fans entirely. So it is quite an involved process that will again require quite a bit of experience. Now the outer facing side of the card is dominated by the massive aluminium heatsink which spans the entire length. There's simply no missing the absurdly large array of aluminium fins that line this graphics card, and never before have I seen anything quite like it on a graphics card. Now the single 12 volt high power PCIe connector is placed in the middle of the card, and because it's embedded about 10 millimeters within the frame, it can be a little bit tricky to access. I should also note that the supplied MSI 4 8 pin to 12 volt high power PCIe adapter features yellow insert tips. This helps the user to ensure the power cable is seated correctly during the installation process, which greatly reduces the risk of connector damage caused by overheating when it's not inserted all the way. The only other noteworthy feature here is the dual bar switch, which allows users to select between the default silent BIOS and the secondary gaming BIOS. 
The dual bias is an essential feature for any mid-range to higher graphics card in my opinion, so MSI ticks that box. Moving around to the back side of the card, we find a massive aluminium backplate that spans most of the card, but towards the end there's a large air pass through, about the size of one of the fans, and MSI has done an excellent job of keeping any branding to a minimum here. So it's a very clean looking design, only including the mandatory GeForce RTX branding. But while the design is very clean and looks great out of the box, it's not a design you can keep clean. The aluminium is brushed in a way that makes it very good at absorbing and trapping oils on your fingers, and removing them is next to impossible, and they look very, very bad. So unless you install this graphics card with rubber gloves and then never touch it again, it's almost certainly going to look dirty and just a bit nasty. So that is a less than optimal choice there by MSI and something they really should not have overlooked because it does spoil the look of the card. And as I said, very, very difficult to restore it to the original look. Then around at the IO, we find a trio of DisplayPort 2.1a outputs and a single HDMI 2.1b output. MSI has only included a two slot bracket here, which should be fine as you really need some kind of GPU support at the opposite end of the card anyway. MSI has also reinforced the Supreme with an aluminium support frame. Essentially, this is a cage that encases the aluminium heatsink, providing a great deal of rigidity and ensures that the PCB isn't placed under excessive load. Okay, so now it's time to take the cooler off, and this is a pretty straightforward job. The removal of 19 screws is required to pry the cooler off, and I do mean pry off as there is a plethora of thermal pads which generate a tremendous amount of suction. Basically, anything on the PCB that could have a thermal pad on it appears to have a thermal pad on it. The PCB measures 220mm long and 145mm tall, so it's quite compact given the overall dimensions of the card, but then MSI does have that huge pass-through area. As for the power delivery, we get 22 power stages for the GPU with 7 for the GDDR7 memory, all using MPS 50 amp power stages. Now the backplate's very thin, especially given how large the surface area is, and I can't imagine it offers much in the way of rigidity. Though that's probably not an issue because we do have that support frame that I just mentioned. The good news is MSI is using this more as a heat spreader by contacting it to the back side of the PCB using thermal pads, which help to extract built up heat behind the GPU and the PCIe power connector. As for the cooler, it weighs 2,366 grams, and that means just over 80% of the graphics card's weight is in the cooler, which probably won't surprise that many of you after looking at this thing. Then with the fans removed, the weight of just the heatsink comes to 1,463 grams. Now at the heart of the cooler is a large 7mm thick copper vapour chamber, which directly contacts the GPU die along with all of the GDDR7 memory chips, efficiently extracting heat from these components and then feeding it into 11 copper heat pipes that are soldered to its surface. There's three 8mm pipes and then eight 6mm pipes. MSI is using a square pipe design for contacting the vapor chamber as this maximizes the contact area and therefore improves cooling performance. I should also note that MSI is using more traditional thermal paste for the interface material between the copper vapor chamber and the GPU die, whereas NVIDIA went with liquid metal for the founder's edition. Also connected to the heatsink are a series of heat spreaders that connect to the VRM components. And overall, I'd say this is an impressive cooler design that appears well built, and therefore I expect it will cool the Supreme SoC graphics card very well. So to find out, let's go over some of the stress test results. Here's a look at how the Supreme SoC operates after an hour playing The Last of Us Part 1 at the 4K resolution using the maximum in-game quality settings. These temperatures were recorded in a 21 degree room installed inside an ATX case with the doors closed. Here we see the GPU hit a peak of 77 degrees, but the fan speed was very low at just 1250 RPM, making the card virtually silent, which is impressive given the 550 watt load. We also saw the GDDR7 memory peak at 82 degrees, so the massive MSI cooler is working exceptionally well. And then if we switch from the silent BIOS over to the secondary gaming BIOS, the fan speed ramps up to 1650 RPM, and now we're seeing a peak GPU temperature of just 67 degrees and a peak memory temperature of just 72 degrees. Now time for some overclocking. By default, the Supreme SoC has a boost clock of 2,565 megahertz and operates the memory at 28 gigabits per second. 
I was able to overclock the cores to 2705 megahertz and the memory to 30 gigabits per second. Once placed under load, these settings allowed the Supreme SoC to reach a stable core frequency of 2970 megahertz, which resulted in an average power draw of 600 watts, and the memory ran at 30 gigabits per second. This increased the GPU temperature to 78 degrees and the memory to 84 degrees, with the auto fan speed of 1410 RPM, as I was using the default BIOS for this overclock. Here's a quick look at how the NVIDIA Founders Edition and Supreme SoC versions of the RTX 5090 compare. Stock the Supreme SoC is quieter, though it did run 4 degrees hotter, but when we switch to the secondary BIOS, it's still quieter than the FE model, but is now able to run 6 degrees cooler, so a big improvement there. Then when we noise normalize both models to 40 decibels, the Supreme SoC ran 8 degrees cooler. I should also note that the FE model does seem to make quite a bit more electrical noise than the Supreme SoC. I guess you could call it coil whine, though the frequency is not normally as high pitched as what I would usually call or associate with coil whine, but it is making electrical noise of some description, much more so than the MSI card, at least our sample of the FE model anyway. As for the memory temperatures, the Supreme SoC was much better than the FE model, running 6 degrees cooler with the stock BIOS, and then a massive 16 degrees cooler with the gaming BIOS. Then once we noise normalized, the MSI card ran 18 degrees cooler, so again a huge improvement there. Now for some gaming benchmarks, and we see the Supreme SoC was a mere 2% faster than the FE model in Dying Light 2, and then just 4% faster once manually overclocked, so I guess pretty disappointing results. That said, we are seeing much better performance in The Last of Us Part 1. Here the Supreme SoC was 5% faster than the FE model and 8% faster once manually overclocked. Then with Delta Force, we see that the Supreme SoC is up to 6% faster than the FE model and I was able to extract a further 4% once overclocked, taking the frame rate up to 175 FPS. Then finally, the gains in Marvel Rivals are pretty typical of what we've already seen. Here the Supreme SoC was 4% faster than the FE model and then 7% once overclocked. Then in terms of power consumption, the Supreme SoC is very power hungry, consuming at least 7% more power than the Founders Edition model, with examples as high as 15%, which is what we see in a Plague Tale Requiem. So given the extreme power use, it's pretty impressive how cool and quiet the Supreme SoC was able to run in our testing. Now one point of concern, or potential concern, is the fact that the stock Supreme SoC was regularly drawing as much as 600 watts across the PCIe connector, which is the maximum rating for this particular connector. And although Nvidia says the melting issues of the past have been solved, this is still a lot of power to draw across a single cable. Then as you can see, our overclock often pushed PCI power draw to 650 watts. So I really hope those connector issues are solved, and I really hope anyone buying an RTX 5090 makes damn sure they've inserted the power cable correctly. Now stock the power connector was peaking at a temperature of 70 degrees, and when overclocked we did see it go as high as 80 degrees, though we weren't recording at that point in time. Both temperatures are safe though, but this does show how hot these connectors do get under regular use when connected correctly. So that concludes our look at the MSI GeForce RTX 5090 Supreme OC. I'm going to try and put that down gently. Uh, yeah, so it's difficult to say how good this model is relative to other partner models, given that you know, this is the first model we've received, the only model we've looked at so far. So we'll have to sort of make those opinions or form those opinions as we look at more and more models, which we do plan to do. We have some Asus, Gigabyte, I think Palette as well. So a few different models on the way and there's some other MSI models that we'll look at as well. And then, you know, difficult to speak to the value of this product again, because we don't really have those reference points. And we also don't even really know what this thing's going to sell for. The prices may be listed online uh, by the time this video goes live. I don't know, but it wasn't at the time of making the video. We know the MSRP is $2,000 US for the RTX 5090, but that's the the starting price, let's say. So the Supreme model is absolutely not going to cost $2,000 US. It will be more than that for sure. So yeah, we'll see. When compared to Nvidia's own Founders Edition model, the Supreme SoC is a completely different beast. The significantly larger cooler does a better job of cooling both the RTX 5090 GPU and its GDDR7 memory, 
but really there are no surprises there. The difference in size between these two models is massive. So as much as I like Nvidia's FE version of the RTX 5090, I feel if I were to spend $2,000 US on a graphics card, or let's be really more than $2,000 US on a graphics card, I'd be getting the Supreme SoC model. If not for the massive cooler, which does work better, but for stuff like the dual BIOS support, which in my opinion is a must have feature. The only other disappointing aspect of the Supreme SoC, other than the backplate, which loves to suck up dirty finger oils, uh, gross, uh, in my opinion is the plastic GPU stand. It feels more like something you'd get with a $500 graphics card, not one priced over $2,000 US. It's a small detail, but when spending this sort of money, I think it is all about the small details, or at least the small details become much more important. That aside though, the Supreme SoC is a very well designed and made graphics card, and while I have no other AIB models to compare it with, so no real reference point beyond the Founders Edition model, I'm confident this will be one of the better options, and that's just based on past experiences testing a wide range of AIB graphics cards, this is certainly something a bit special. That being the case, I'm also keen to check out the Liquid version, and I should hopefully have a review ready for you sometime next week. For now, that is going to do it for my review of the MSI RTX 5090 Supreme OC. I've also enjoyed this workout. It's been a good little session. I'm feeling pretty good. And uh, yeah, I might put this card back in the system and then relax and do some gaming. So it's kind of serves two purposes. It's kind of like a portable gym and a, an entertainment gaming thingamajigger. So yeah, there's that. Anyway, let me know what you think about this beast in the comment section below and I'll be reading your feedback and hopefully some other reviewers will have looked at some different models so you'll be able to go and get a sense of where things sit there. But as I said, I will have other cards coming in that we can compare uh, in a more so apples to apples fashion using the same test methods that I use to measure the thermals and performance of this card. But other than that, haven't got too much more to say other than thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve. I'll see you again next time.